evening. I am back with more Agora at the Left Hand of God by Robert Svoboda. I will be picking up at the introduction. This is the story of the Agori Vimalananda. An Agori is a practitioner of the spiritual discipline known as Agora. The word Agora can be interpreted as deeper than deep or as gentle, or filled with light, illumined. Agora is the apotheosis of Tantra, the Indian religion whose supreme deity is the mother goddess. Tantra has thus far been glimpsed in the West only in its most vulgar and debased forms, promulgated by unscrupulous scoundrels who equate sex with superconsciousness. Sex is indeed central to Tantra, the cosmic sexual union of universal dualities. The aim of Tantra is Laya, return of the seeker to the state of undifferentiated existence. Actually, Tantra cannot be termed a religion because it is bereft of tenets and dogma. It consists, consists only of methods for achieving this laya, or union of the individual with the infinite. This union is described with a sexual metaphor, the union of the personal ego, which is female, with the absolute male. Under special circumstances, sexual rituals are employed in Tantra to hasten spiritual progress, but the concept of li licentiousness is totally foreign to the Tantric tradition. Tantra has been divided into right-hand and left-hand paths. The right-hand path involves a search for the unlimited reality via the road of external imposition of purity. While its practices may seem strange to some, its emphasis on personal purity will be familiar to those in the West who know of Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga, and Raja Yoga, all of which conform, more or less, to orthodox ideals of religious discipline. The left-hand path has attracted attention to itself by the action of those unwise souls who seek quick and easy spiritual development without any preliminary renunciation of sensory gratification. The results of such rashness is invariably indulgence of the worst and most blatant sort, which has damaged the left-hand path's reputation. The left-hand path relies on its practitioners' absolute internal purity to protect them while they practice rituals which may involve necromancy, intoxicants, sex, or other forbidden practices. Most serious aspirants automatically shun the left-hand path because of its potential for misuse, which is indeed great. It is truly treacherous for the unwary. One text observes that walking on swords or riding a tiger is child's play by comparison. Ironically, those undisciplined individuals who cannot succeed at the left-hand path are naturally attracted to it by the potential for un unbridled indulgence it seems to proffer, while those sincere seekers who might eventually succeed at it are frightened away by its temptations. There are a few, though, who dare and who successfully complete the rigorous left-hand training of Tantra and Agora. Strict renunciation is the prerequisite, extreme enough to purify the aspirant through and through. Only when purity is perfected is the aspirant assigned rituals, which to the untutored observer might seem hedonistic or sinful. Agora is not indulgence. It is the forcible transformation of darkness into light, of the opacity of the limited individual personality into the luminescence of the absolute. Renunciation disappears once you arrive at the Absolute, because then nothing remains to renounce. And Aguri goes so deeply into darkness, into all things undreamable to ordinary mortals, that he comes out into light. Sects in India are often distinguished by color of turban or drape of robe. Popularly, Aguris have been stereotyped as ash-swathed ascetics, with long matted hair who walk through life wild-eyed, skulking about in charnel grounds wrestling with jackals for carcasses. The title Aguri is claimed by some groups who even assert an exclusive right to it. Vimalananda had his own definition of Aguri, which was independent of any doctrine or dogma. Indeed, his usage of terms like Vedic and Tantra may also be devoid of detectable textual support, for he never cared for texts. He believed 
and it is a noble Indian tradition to do so, that a lineage's practices prevail over textual injunctions. Whatever you believe yourself to be, you are, if you are, a sincere, if you are sincere and honest enough. You are responsible for yourself, and your opinion of yourself is authoritative. This attitude often irritates those who have invested heavily in the infallibility of any one text or group of texts, but then Vimalananda had no use for organized religion anyway. As you read his story, remember that what he called Vedic might not necessarily be Vedic to a temple priest, but that both opinions might be equally valid according to context. Throughout his life, Vimalananda resisted any attempt to fit him into any mold. He guarded his originality jealously. He was without doubt distinctly individual, but simultaneously he was exceedingly difficult to pin down and define. What we speak of in this book as Agora is solely according to Vimalananda's teachings. He studied many systems and selected elements from each, Bhakti Yoga, Kundalini Yoga, and others. He melded them into a tool which he employed to advance himself. He believed that each individual should carve out his own niche, study what he or she could understand, select those practices which they could do sincerely, and do them faithfully. So by this definition, Agora would always be different for everyone. Only the Agori's attitude would be held in common. Each Agori would follow different practices, but all Agoris follow them with the same intensity and disregard for self-preservation. To Vimalananda, the true Aghori cannot be recognized by any external sign or mark. Experience in the world of ascetics had taught him that many fake Aghoris lurk under outward appurtenances. Uh, appurtenances. Can't read that word. I'm retarded. And he stoutly maintained that the true Agora is wholly internal. Sectarian Aghoris might well take issue with this opinion. But Vimalananda lived up to it. He lived in an ordinary flat in Bombay and went about his business inconspicuously. Inside, he was pure agori, as hard as diamonds or as soft as wax, as the situation demanded. To his spiritual children, he was the perfect mother, a combination of friend, philosopher, and guide. To those with inflated spiritual egos, he was merciless. One immutable tenet of agora is that death is to be personified and deified. Agoris crave not for physical death, but for destruction of all their limitations, killing themselves by internal or external processes. Agoris do not fear death. Once embarked upon a course of action, the true Agori neither succeeds or dies trying, for there is no middle ground and no retreat. Agoris love to spend time in cemeteries and burning grounds, collectively called Smashan in Hindi. An Aghori is never happier than when he is seated intoxicated in the Smashan, performing a ritual near a funeral pyre, flames shooting up to the flames shooting up to lick the midnight blackness. Vimalananda, so concerned with external propri propriety in other ways, never hesitated to visit the Smashan when he had rituals to perform. Some of the events described in this book may well offend the reader's sensitivities. Part of this was Vimalananda's intention. He wanted Western holier-than-thou renunciates to know that filth and orgies in the graveyard, as one American once described Agora, can be as conducive to spiritual advancement as can asanas, pranayama, and other purer disciplines. But another part is intrinsic to Agora. In many ways it is and must remain totally incomprehensible to the ordinary person. And for some people, no amount of explanation will satisfy when they question the wisdom or the spiritual benefit inherent in, say, consumption of human brain. Agora is mysterious and deep, deeper than deep, in fact, and only those who can lay aside all their cultural clothing and plunge into it naked can dive into its depths. <clears throat> when Vimalananda and I were in America, one of my friends asked him, as much as I have read about you and heard about you, now listen to you. I still cannot understand what an Aghori is. Would you please try to explain it to me?" Vimalananda told me later. She asked me so honestly and earnestly that I felt I had to reply eloquently, even though this is really not something you can put into so many words. 
he told her, an agori is beyond the bound of the earthly shackles, nay, something above the elements, which shape the universe and you. He takes a sort of intoxicant and thus gets intoxicated in supreme love which emanates from the innermost recesses of his heart. Shall I call it interiority? It is that which is beyond awareness. He gives off the best part of love. Why part? Part of the supreme, universal love, where one experiences, with the help of perception, all in one, one in all. When you, the finite, merge into infinity, what dost thou not know? During this stage, he merges with his own deity, so that he becomes him, capital H. That is why he is said to have gone from darkness to divine enlightenment. This is an agori. Vimalananda was an extremist. He was certain that anything worth doing was worth doing well, and he was ready to stake his all to ensure that whatever he began was completed. For him, Agora was the doctrine of no return, a personal creed which demanded relinquishing all in exchange for divine love. He wanted to warn spiritual dilettantes in the West that the frivolity which with, with which they treat discipline and the self-delusion they attempt to pass off as enlightenment is merely a cheating of their own consciousness, which leads only to the pit. For example, when I was once unwise enough to comment that a certain guru was supposedly awakening his disciples' kundalinis by boffing them with a peacock feather duster, Vimalananda exploded in reply, as the kundalini shakti becomes so cheap that some so-called godman can awaken it in multitudes of people all at once? Oh no! Were our rishis, ancient seers, fools to spend decades out in the jungles working hard at penances to awaken kundalini and perfect agora? No, the people who think they can buy kundalini are the fools. Westerners think they can purchase the knowledge, but all they get for their money is fake teachers from India who dish out any slop to them and get rich on their gullibility. Vimalananda conformed to none of the usual guru stereotypes. When at the races, he dressed like the horse owner he was. When at home, he dressed like an ordinary Indian. He ate meat on occasion, used intoxicants frequently, and smoked cigarettes incessantly. He did all these things for specific but hidden reasons. Most of the people who knew him only formally never suspected that he might be of a spiritual bent. He cultivated this carefree image deliberately to avoid attracting attention to himself. This led me to early skepticism of his spiritual prowess, for I had been brainwashed by spiritual authorities to expect a certain role from a guru. Fortunately for me, I soon learned that Vimalananda's revulsion toward hypocrisy and posturing was exceeded in strength only by his obstinacy. At one time he had actively attempted to speed certain persons along the spiritual path, but was unsuccessful with them due to their unpreparedness. He thereupon determined to provide real tools for spiritual cultivation only to those students whom he had first thoroughly tested and prepared. Hence. He never referred to himself as a guru, nor did he act in the way we have come to expect gurus to act. For example, when he chose to call me Rabbi, he did so because it is, it is cognate with my nickname, Rabbi, and it was more convenient to use while speaking in an Indian language. It was not because he wanted to impress me by giving me some Sanskrit name. He made, he made a show of complete disinterest in teaching while actually spending much time evaluating the strengths and weaknesses of each of his spiritual children. This Indian tradition is known as Kerma Guru, literally tortoise teacher. After a mother tortoise buries her eggs on a sandy beach, it is said that she retreats a certain distance and then concentrates on those eggs with such an intense current of love that the warmth of her love reaches the eggs and causes them to hatch. In the same way, a Kerma Guru seems to pay no attention to his disciples' progress, but in reality monitors them, monitors them closely and sometimes pulls their strings from afar. Vimalananda's entire life was teaching and being taught. He was always ready to learn something new, 
and always ready to teach in his own way if a student was sincerely willing to learn. His day-to-day -day life was a lesson for whoever, he, whoever could understand it, a continual resubmission of his will to the divine will. He was not easy to fathom, and he deliberately made his lessons hard to understand. When he decided I should learn something, he would deftly insert it into a flood of mundane trivialities directed at others in the room, and would expect me to be alert enough to pick it out. Weeks or months later, he would question me about it, suddenly and without warning. I would be expected not only to have noted and remember the datum, but to have processed it internally to fit my own situation as best I could. He often observed, what sort of educational system do we have nowadays? They announce their examination in advance so that any idiot, idiot can mug up a bunch of notes in preparation. The key to testing someone is to test them when they least suspect it and are least prepared for it. Then you have an accurate idea of how much they really know. Sometimes just keeping up with Vimal Ananda's talks was test enough. Depending on his mood and audience, he might speak in very fluent high British English, in colloquial Gujarati, or most commonly in Hindi. When the mood struck him, he could switch to high-flown Urdu, and sometimes stabbed at Marathi or Bengali. He was an actor by inclination, and he had an incredible command over a wide variety of language styles, which he could permute at will to obtain precisely the right effect on his audience. Over the eight years and nine months that I was privileged to know him, he repeated each of his favorite stories a dozen times or more, but never the same way each time. Each repetition was uniquely flavored by his delivery. Translation was thus no easy task. I have rendered all his words into English approximating in his usual English style the intent which flowed through whatever vocabulary, syntax, and dictation he was employing whatever language he was speaking at the time. Working from memory and from the brief notes I would jot down after our conversations, I decided it would be most effective to leave the narrative in his own words throughout, so the readers can imagine if they like that so the readers can imagine if they like that they too sat with Vimalananda and heard him tell his tales. There's another reason for presenting his words as they were spoken. Vimalananda's impression on people was achieved primarily not by what he did, but by how he did it. Not by what he said, though this was important, but by how he said it. Who he was, who he was was more sin significant than what he did. But he made people dig for his interior reality, and most often, they would come up empty-handed. Those few who knew him well, at least superficially, could never agree with each other on who he was, because his personality differed for each of his friends. He was a multitude of different people, all in one body. Once before he had met me, he had a desire to jot down his musings and to accompany them with testimonies from his close acquaintances. He asked several of his friends, if you had to write down something about me, what would you write? One replied with a single word, versatile. Another said, words cannot express the reality. A third opined, I would just turn in a blank sheet of paper because by saying nothing, everything is said. His foster daughter had the last word by informing him, no one has any business to read about you because unless they have experienced you, they could never know the reality. She was motivated by possessiveness, no doubt, and in fact knew him better than did any of the rest of us, but her point is well taken. How does one convey a two-dimensional print? How does one convey in two-dimensional print a multi-dimensional being? And it was not that he had anything to hide. There was nothing inscrutable about him. He never put on airs. He was available for everyone's scrutiny. He would talk to us in the way a child talks to its mother neglecting to alter or hold back anything for the sake of self-image. He was a true innocent at heart, a child in many ways, never ashamed to display his innocent wonderment or admit his mistakes. And like a child, he could equally well be a bad loser at games. The agori in him expected to win.
Perhaps it was because of this child within him that he could be such a good mother to all those around him, or perhaps his concentration on the Divine Mother engendered the child in him. Whatever the causation, he was like a truly incorrigible child, a prankster from birth, always out for a gentle practical joke, ready to laugh at anything funny and to make anyone else laugh if he could. Nothing was bland around him. He could be miserable, overjoyed, or profoundly ta taciturn. He was never merely ha sad, happy, or quiet. His Agora training had taught him to succeed or die. He never played any role half-heartedly, but threw himself fully into everything he did, no matter how minor. There was not a phony bone in his body. The personality Vimalananda was indeed amazingly versatile. His family w once owned most of Bombay, and his early life was pr princely, but the life of idle riches never tempted him. He knew by turns fabulous wealth and wretched poverty, and served variously as an army officer, textile machinery manufacturer, dairy owner, quarry operator, racehorse gambler, and anchorite. He achieved high academic qualifications and observed strict spiritual disciplines. Experts at Indian music regarded him as both an instrumental and vocal maestro. Among those who knew him, he was renowned for his expertise at astrology. His ability to diagnose disease by merely looking at a patient's face and his capacity to interpret the body markings on horses and elephants. In his youth, he was a semi-pro wrestler and won his last bout at age 38, defeating a boy half his age. I never saw him beaten at arm wrestling, even when his opponent was a powerful young wrestler one-third his age. His friends regularly demanded that he cook for them, so tasty and unique were his culinary concoctions. He could move each and every muscle in his body, including his ears and eyebrows, in time to music as a, revolt, as a result of his training in Indian dance. He was an artist. He liked to say, here in India, we believe in watching the artist at work, not in looking at the work of the artist. Artistry is not what the artist produces, but is the artist himself producing. A great composer's music may be transmitted from generation to generation in the West. Our great musicians do not concentrate on creating compositions. They create new musicians to maintain the progression of the artistry. How can one then transmit Vimalananda's artistry to anyone who has not seen it at work? The use of his words as transmission of his art but only alert readers will be able to detect the subtlety of his artistry at work there beneath. Vimal and Nanda could learn from anyone and would make whatever he learned more artistic. He put the stamp of his personality on everything he said, did, and created. And it is my hope that this stamp appears on these pages as well. He was charming and profound, and sometimes it may seem that he was in awe of himself. In a way, he was. He was not conceited. He was in awe of what was within him. Chapter 8 on Avishkara explains this more fully. He could be egotistical, and some of that ego is reflected in these pages. He maintained that death of the ego meant certain death of the organism and so never tried the, to expunge his ego, preferring to keep it tightly under his control. He equated the ego, the individual's power of self-identification, with the much misunderstood Kundalini Shakta, Kundalini Shakti. His control of his Kundalini enabled him to disengage his consciousness from his own limited, if versatile personality, so that he could self-identify with unlimited divine personalities. Often, when he spoke, it was with the awesome confidence of divinity speaking through him, and this sometimes seemed arrogant to those humans who heard, but could not or would not comprehend it. He could be maddening to deal with when he thought he was right, but happened to be mistaken. There were times I found it difficult to respect Vimalananda, and other times when it was difficult to like him very much, but it was never difficult to love him. When first we met, I analyzed him, dissected his opinions, 
and attempted to preserve the objective aloofness I felt was appropriate for a Western scientist. All in vain, for the current of warmth which flowed continuously over whoever he took into his circle of children was irresistible. My distrustful Western nature balked at first, but eventually my doubt dissolved in spite of itself, and he and I settled into the seemingly preordained role of father and son. Or perhaps, I should say, father and mother and son, for never did his love lose its motherliness. Two principles guided his teachings. Compassion for all beings, including the seemingly insentience such as rocks and perpetual awareness of Rinanu Bandana, Rinanu Bandana, the bondage of karmic debt. His compassion for his friends led him to ruin his health and exhaust his wealth to insulate them as far as possible from their own karmic debts. His shoulders were unusually wide, perhaps from his wrestling, and he used to say, since nature has given me such broad shoulders, I should support whomever I can. Why should any child worry about Renanu Vandana when its mother or father is there to repay its debts? He treated all who came before him, even the buffoons, as a fond and indulgent mother would treat her beloved children. Women found him irresistible because he projected onto every female the same tremendous devotion which he directed in his worship toward the mother goddess. Until his dying day, Vimalananda's sole refuge was the motherhood of God. He and I selected the name Vimalananda for use in his book from the many names he used during his lifetime. Its variety of meanings makes it appropriate, appropriately representative of who he was. In Sanskrit, Vimalananda equi equals Vimala, pure, plus Ananda, joy or bliss, or literally, the bliss of purity. Malam, let me try to say this, Malam Vidvam Sayati, Iti Vimala. The absolute annihilation of filth is Vimala. Vimala. Filth is here, the filth of attribution, the limitations imposed upon pure existence as a result of its incar incarnation. I'm going to read that again. Filth here is the filth of attribution, the limitations imposed upon pure existence as a result of, his, of its incarnation. When the cosmic play of creation, preservation, and destruction is transcended, all limitation is transcended. And that state is Vimala. Or, when an aspirant has gone beyond the ego's flaws, when the ego is completely naked, cleansed of its accretion, accretions of personality and its stains of desire, then it perceives pure consciousness, and knows that pure consciousness to be both thyself and myself, and that is Vimala. Or the Ananda an Agori receives from his rituals cannot be purer, Vimala because he sees the face of his beloved deity in everything and everyone. Vimalananda can be derived in many different ways in Sanskrit, but its special significance here is that Vimalananda's physical mother was named Vimala. Vimala plus Nanda equals son of Vimala. Vimalananda told me, when I was a wandering ascetic, I thought it would be wonderful to appear at my home one day and the servant announced to my mother, Vimalananda has come. What joy it would have given her. So, Vimalananda it was for this book, in lieu of other such names as Agora Nath, Master of Agora, Shah i Malj, King of Bliss, or even Bandal i Aftab, Son Among Exaggerators. This last is significant in that Vimalananda was, well, larger than life some of his stories may seem expanded beyond the bounds of plausibility. We Westerners ordinarily equate truth with the objective reality of sense perception. Vimalananda was concerned only that the subjective reality of the stories he told exert specific effects on the subjective realities of his listeners. For he held that objective reality is continuously being altered by our perceptions of it. 
Thus, it is immaterial if, for example, someone really does cut off his limbs and throw them into a blazing fire, only to have them reattach spontaneously after several hours, or whether he merely visualized the scenario so intensely that he thoroughly convinces himself that the events in did indeed occur. The result, increased stability of mind, regardless of external irritant, will create increased physical stability as well. For the mind, reality is defined by its perceptions. Agora is total control of perception. When Vimalananda felt it essential to make a point to some child, he would unhesitatingly exaggerate or magnify his stories, just as we might do for real children. Also, Vimalananda spoke mainly for Indians, who often inflate the content of events they report. Indian listeners have learned to automatically compensate for this expansion by mentally scaling down whatever is said. Thus, Vimalananda's exaggeration would be perceived approximately accurate by an Indian listener. I mention this because I was continuously aware of this cultural trait and have accounted for it. The stories you read here have been calibrated for maximum veracity, at least in the system of reality in which Vimalananda lived. Also, the language of this book has been slightly sanitized at his own request. He used to make regular use of vulgarity, but only when he spoke with people whose normal speech is vulgar, in order to be coherent with them. In addition, each cuss word was spoken with a hidden meaning behind it, a hoary tantric tradition called Santya Basha, but that is another story. No idle, no idle tale ever escaped his lips. Each was aimed at a specific listener and might change its form according to the lesson he felt the listener needed to learn, though all his stories were based on incidents which actually happened to him, at least subjectively. As noted above, however, he transcended the blasé factuality of objective reality and ascended into the mythic. His tales were carefully textured with deep meanings available to the clever pupil who could properly interpret the words and the intonation and emotion with which they were spoken, ignoring the minor detail which Vimalananda himself scorned. Vimalananda would unveil a story and present it to an assembly of people in his living room when the conversation seemed completely innocuous and someone in that company would hear it and realize that it referred to a situ situation about which he had intended to ask Vimalananda, but had thus far been unable to do so. There was a thrill in sitting quietly and suddenly realizing that a story was being directed at you. Vimalananda would not often target anyone by name, but a word here or a clue there would give his intention away. Vimalananda loved to play consciously with his children, just as a mother plays abstractedly with hers, all the while maintaining awareness of the pot on the stove. Vimalananda likewise manifested otherness continually. An eternal sense of other spheres of activity and other levels of awareness which operated in him sim simultaneously. He acknowledged this and often said, to be really aware, you must be able to know simultaneously what is going on thousands of miles away. What may have happened here centuries ago, what will happen anywhere in the world decades from now, and what is occurring has occurred or will occur on other planes of existence. And you must still act as if you know nothing. You must just sit and talk with other people and play the part which nature has assigned to you. In his music, his conversation, his chess, and even his sleep, he was always aware both of what was going on around him and also effortless, effortlessly of some other reality. Or at least he made it seem effortless, though it sure involved tremendous strain which occasionally showed through. He credited tobacco with his ability to function in several planes of being at once. After close observation of him for, for years, I can state confidently that though he was addicted to cigarettes, a fact he made no attempt to conceal, tobacco certainly did seem to exert a markedly beneficial effect on his consciousness, infinitely more than I have seen in, in any other smoker. Modern scientific research has demonstrated that small doses of nicotine have a positive influence on brain function 
Vimalananda was such a veteran of intoxicants that he could easily imbibe more nicotine than anyone else without del deleterious effects. Smoking did eventually kill him, or so his doctors said, from cardiac failure. Those of us who knew him knew he decided exactly six months before dying that he intended to die. His excuse was that he had finished everything in his life that he, had, that he was expected to do, and to live any longer would be to attract new karmas. He also predicted, for years, that the day he gave up smoking would be the day he died. For as long as I knew him, he smoked at least one cigarette daily until December 11th, 1983, a day on which he refused a cigarette whenever it was offered, fully aware of what he was doing. The next morning he died. At sunset, I cremated him. From the day we met, Vimalananda had been telling me I would cremate him, in spite of his natural son, who still lives in Bombay, and who, according to Hindu tradition, should have cremated his father. But Vimalananda always said, even eight years before the fact, my son will not even come to the Smashan to watch me burn, nor will my wife. Indeed, they did not. When once I asked him about this, he told me, there is no escaping the law of karma. I have told everyone the truth, that you are destined to cremate me, and all of them have become jealous of you because they think they deserve to be involved themselves somehow. They don't know what they are talking about, or else they wouldn't act that way. I may have a physical son, but you are my spiritual son, and I will have a death my way. Do you know what is in Aguri's profoundest expression of love? It is these four words. You will cremate me. You will assist me to return to my beloved. And when I am burning, I only desire one thing. Play a tape recording of Jim Reeves singing Precious Lord, Take My Hand. I know all the Hindus will think it's sacrilege, but pay no attention to them. That's all I desire. No rituals, no phoniness. I only want to go back where I belong. And to have my big, da my big daddy take me there by the hand. Vimalananda was cremated on the same pyre which had previously hosted his father, his mother, and his young son, Ranu, years before him. Jim Reeves' voice did sing at his funeral to help release him from his earthly shackles. Most of his, most of his ashes were consigned to the Arabian Sea, whose surf pounds the outer wall of the, ba the Banganja Smashan in Bombay. The rest were collected for the ritual immersion in India's sacred rivers. This has been a difficult book for me to write. I have spent months groping for direction, writing and rewriting, hoping to locate the best angle from which to approach the freeze Vimalananda in prose. Eventually, I realized that he cannot be portrayed justly from a single angle. Just, that it was n just as it was never possible to capture him definitively on film, he always avoided the camera, and none of his photographs, which do exist, rem resemble each other. In fact, it was always difficult to recognize the living Vimalananda from his pictures, because his entire face would change moment by moment according to his state of consciousness at the moment. He was loath to part with photos of himself, which is why none adorn this book. He would say, my friends will not like it if you, don't take care, if you don't take care of my photo. They will view it as a sign of disrespect. I don't care. I am just a nobody. But some of my ethereal friends are very orthodox and very strict, and will not think twice before they punish for disrespect. He certainly was not confined by the restrictions which confine most mortals. His eyes, for example, refused to remain the same color at all times. Sometimes they were light blue, Often they were light green, the color of the grape, known as Anab -e Anab -e Shahai. At some moments they could become at some moments they could become nearly colorless. People meeting him for the first time would point it out to him incredulous, incredulously, and he would disclaim an agreement. How ridiculous! Is it possible for anyone's eyes to change colors? At other times, when he was feeling playful, he would adjust his eye color to match mine, and he would then call everyone in the room over to see and comment. He loved to watch people react to an out of the ordinary event because he felt he could gauge them better when they were caught off guard.
enigma, a puzzle, a paradox, a riddle, a mark of interrogation, as he himself put it. Who was Vimalananda? The more I remain in his company, the less I knew about him. He really was nobody. There was no one personality present perpetually in his body, which could be pinned down and categorically identified as his. He could be hard and soft by turns, alternately refined and coarse according to his environs. One memorable night, we started off dining elegantly at a posh turf club party, and ended up, as fate would have it, listening to music in the middle of Bombay's red light district. Vimalananda finally took up an instrument himself and taught the, di the, the delighted prostitutes a new song, just for fun. Psychiatrists would probably classify Vimalananda as schizophrenic. Vimalananda himself used to say, Either I must be mad, or everyone else is. There are no two ways about it. The no psychiatrist, though no psychiatrist, I am a licensed, licensed physician, and in my opinion, an opinion shared by those who lived with him for many years before I met him, he was far saner than the rest of the world. Facile formulae cannot describe him. I wrote this book knowing well that some of what is written will be offensive, or at least incomprehensible to some, and that other passages will impel the curiosity of others to try out some of the more daring procedures. The natural reticence I felt for permitting Vimalananda to be introduced to an unprepared audience would have prevented this material from any publica publication had I not had clear instructions to do so. It began years ago, when a man dressed as a medieval Rajput warrior was invited to Vimalananda's home in Bombay. After some preliminaries, the spirit of a hero centuries dead, Kalaji Rathad, entered this man's body, broke open coconuts with a cavalry saber, and made predictions from the pieces thus formed. He advised me, when my turn came, to note down everything Vimalananda spoke. Vimalananda who was not usually impressed by such performances, and who had assiduously refused to allow anyone to record any of his words up to this time, mysteriously agreed and even encouraged me in this. He never read any of my writing on him until the first draft of, draft of this manuscript was ready. When I presented it to him, he turned through a few pages, made a few comments, and lapsed quickly into his former seeming disinterest. Vimalananda cloaked his meanings more thoroughly than ever before after making this agreement, or after making this assignment. His asking me from time to time if I had noted down some particularly intricate comment suggested to me that he still expected me to continue in my role as scribe. He continued to engineer situations, a pastime at which he was expert and he would make use of the situations which developed spontaneously around him in his home, which was a veritable circus. During and after the unfolding of the situation, he would test me on what I had learned. As soon as Vimalananda felt he had dispelled my major doubts on a subject, he would usually refuse to talk about it in any longer... As soon as Vimalananda felt he had dispelled my major doubts on a subject, he would usually refuse to talk about it any longer, expecting me to learn more about it from direct experience. He explained that this would preserve the keenness of my spiritual hunger, to prevent me from ever losing my alertness or pausing in my pondering. He never spoon-fed me. Gradually, I accumulated a heap of information, enough to fill at least four books. The writing and rewriting of this book has enabled me to digest Vimalananda's teachings more efficiently, and I understand that Vimalananda's real intention in making me write was for the writing to act as sadhana, spiritual exercise, for me. Summaries and conclusions are supposed to close the books they serve, but I am listing mine here in the, in the introduction. I cannot summarize Vimalananda, nor can I conclude anything at all about him. During the last visit of the Emperor Akbar's personality into Vimalananda's body, His Majesty told us, Do you think you know the possessor of this body? You know nothing. If he is your friend and loved one, well, we spirits love him too. But don't be so stupid and insolent to think you can comprehend him. I do not know him. You cannot know him. No one knows him. This is the sort of man who allows you to play about with him, you fools. 
apart from knowing him in his entirety, you will never, never be able to know a single hair from the head of Vimalananda. Vimalananda himself requested me to compile my notes into this book and publish it now. He wanted Westerners to be exposed to Agora. In his own words, I once wanted to go to the West to demonstrate the practical use of Agora, the real spiritual science of India. I know I can deliver the goods, but whenever I tried to go, my mentors always prevented me. They didn't want me tempted by glamour and power. They knew I could be a better businessman than anyone else. It is in my genes, after all. But they didn't want to watch me fall so low. I am not destined for commercialization. I am destined for something different. It is not necessary to publish this while I am alive. I have not achieved all I have achieved in this life merely to capitalize on it. I don't want the last years of my life to be spoiled by curiosity seekers who want, me, who want to meet me to find out if I am for real. I know who I am, and I don't care what anyone else thinks. Besides that, if I become too well known, I'll have to sit on a throne and say things like blessings be upon you, which is bull because you can't give blessings away like that. I won't be able to move about freely in society and play about as I do now. No more jokes, no more laughing sprees. I'll have to become stern and solemn. Why should I give up what little peace and quiet I have now just to be worshipped by a bunch of people who don't even know what they're doing? How do all these so-called sta saints stand it, I wonder? Publish this book after I'm gone. Let people know the truth. Let them know what is what. Out of the thousands who may read it, at least a few will be sincere. They will try to learn more, and then nature herself will make arrangements for them to learn just as she did for me. And they will be taught according to their capabilities. The progression will go on. There's nothing to fear. I have never gone out and tried to attract anyone to me. People have come and gone. I don't ask them to come. I don't object when they go. What is it to me? I only want a few. If I love one or a few, I can love well. If I try to love all, I will just be cheating myself. Only Jesus could love all. From Vimalananda's select circle of loved ones, I was awarded the commission to try to explain to those who never met him just who and what he was. Hence this book. No one can disturb him now. His story can be told and his privacy will be preserved. I am pleased to offer this volume to those who can read it. I regard it as an offering to him, an offering which is, which is also a promise I have kept, an obligation I have requited. A long-standing desire of his I have finally fulfilled. Here is Vimalananda as I knew him. Even after hundreds of meetings, he could baffle me with the incredible variegation of his knowledge, charm me with his ever-present effluence, and infect me with a smile with, a, with his good humor. I even almost got used to his anger, but having charmed and enthralled me and his other listeners, he never tired of telling us. Don't take anything I say as gospel truth. I am human. I make mistakes. Test on yourselves what I've told you. Try it out. Experience it. And then you will know whether or not I am telling you the truth. When you examine a gem, you must evaluate it from its facets before you can decide on its value. Here then is Vimalananda for your evaluation. That is the end of the introduction. Next time will be chapter one, entitled Ma. Hopefully I won't be so mush mouth. Maybe I shouldn't drink so much. Maybe I, sh I should drink more. I haven't decided. I will see you next time. God bless.